But uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we'll get started here. Um, so I was praying about this time and thinking about it. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and so um, I was just reminded of a scene really I looked at recently in my life. Um, I don't know what happened in my spiritual journey, but um, somewhere in my journey, I got away from the Gospels. And I don't know why. I, I don't know where that happened. Uh, but a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, um, I just realized that spending time in the Gospels had become a lesser part of my Bible reading and Bible study, uh, which was contrary because the Gospels are what give me a picture of what God's aiming for in my life. Uh, you know, Romans 8.29 says we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so the more I understand the image of Christ, the clearer picture I get of what God's aiming at in my life in the various trials and circumstances he rolls me into. Uh, I've often said that when something happens in my life, I really don't have the right to ask God why. I know the why is Christ's likeness. The question I get to ask is what? What quality of Christ are you trying to instill in me uh, through this event? And so in light of that, uh, I was just driven back uh, to make the Gospels a more regular part of my reading and my study uh, and really try to understand the person of Christ because, again, uh, it, the Gospels are like a jigsaw or like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You put the box on the table and it tells you what you're aiming at, and that's what the Gospels do for me. They give me a clear picture of what God's aiming at in my life through the various events that uh, he allows into it. And so uh, I spent some time some time ago and, and then was just redirected last night uh, to a scene in Luke 7. It's just one of the more interesting uh, interactions with Christ. Uh, most of them are interesting. Uh, but um, but in, in Luke 7, he, he encounters a man who we never meet. It's amazing how many people in the Bible... Especially in interact with Christ, we never know their names. The Bible describes them, it doesn't name them. Uh, and there's another these people uh, who, who it describes uh, no clue uh, what his name is. Uh, but in chapter 7, it had been a typical preceding up to this uh, busy time in the life of our Lord. Uh, the previous chapter included healings, the calling of the twelve apostles... Uh, he cast out a few demons. Uh, he kind of gave uh, a scaled-down version of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, which was a very intense teaching uh, in which Christ makes it clear in Matthew 5 and in Luke 7 uh, that those who follow him by faith will live lives that are countercultural, no matter what culture they find themselves in. Uh, that they will live lives that are radically different uh, from those around them who do not follow Christ. And, and those, both those uh, sermon illustrations make that incredibly clear. On the hills of that, he enters Capernaum, um, a city on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, a busy city, a crowded city, a prosperous region in Rome. Uh, Christ would spend a fair amount of time there. Some call it uh, his ministry hometown, some scholars have called it that. Um, and we know historically uh, that a city that size of that importance would have a pretty strong military presence uh, for obvious reasons. Um, as Christ enters that city, the Bible zeroes in on one man who's actually not in the large crowd that's around Christ. He is a centurion, a Roman military commander. Uh, he is a man we will find of might. Uh, we will find he is a man of authority. Uh, most feel he was a mid to high ranking military commander. It would make sense based on what he says. Uh, he's stationed in a very important region. Uh, according to if you were in, in the Roman uh, administration. Um, and, and he's not normal because uh, we find that he has an issue. Uh, he has a servant. Uh, could be easily translated slave. Uh, and, and that servant is dear to him, uh, and that servant is about to die. Now, 
that's the first clue this is not a normal military commander in Rome. Uh, because in the days of Rome, uh, servants or slaves were just simply property. Uh, historians speculate there was over a half million servants or slaves in Rome at this time. Uh, if one didn't make it, you just went and bought another one. Or in his case, you probably just took another one. Uh, and, and so they were just property. They were just disposable. There was, there was no sense of human value. No sense of made in God's image. Just disposable people at his discretion. And, and so the fact that he's got one that is dear to him, that's sick, and he cares enough to do something, speaks something about him. Uh, it says in verse 3, When he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to Christ, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, The one for whom you do this uh, is deserving. This whole scene is out of place in the life of Christ. Because there's some things in this scene you see very few places, if anywhere else, in the Gospels. One of those things is the Jewish leaders begging Christ for anything. <laughs> usually when the Jewish leaders, the elders, engage Christ, it's usually a time of contention. Uh, they're trying to trap him. Uh, they're trying to uh, catch him in his word. They're trying to stir up the crowds. Uh, these are not men who tend to beg anybody earnestly. Uh, much less this person who they feel is a fraud uh, and is not the promised Messiah. And, and so right away, which speaks about the centurion to a large degree, but begging Christ earnestly, I don't think is something you see anywhere else from these men in the entire pages of the Gospels. But in this scene, they are. Uh, there is no conflict there is no duplicity in them. They're not trying to set a trap. They're not trying to catch him in his words. For one of the few times their motives are actually correct uh, as they encounter Christ. Uh, and they come to Christ and they humble themselves. And again, this is completely out of place in the Gospels. And they beg Christ earnestly to come do this for this centurion. And, and in verse 5, they state his resume. They say to Christ, he loves our nation and he has built us a synagogue. That's pretty impressive. And it worked. <laughs> Christ's like, okay, let's go. I, I mean, they, they approach him correctly. They approach him humbly. They approach him earnestly. Uh, they state the reason, uh, and, and, and Christ is like, yeah, let, let me leave what I'm doing, uh, and let's go take care of it. it said, I, now, I believe that, that Christ's decision to do that, based on what happened next, surprised the centurion, because it says in verse 6, when Christ got not far from his house, which means he's been traveling toward his house, uh, he sends, he dispatches another group that the Bible calls friends. So, uh, these are closest to it. And, and, and here is the message that the friends greet Christ who's not far from his house. It says in verse 6, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof Therefore, I didn't even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. I need to break that down, because we're finding a moment that really impressed Christ. Do not trouble yourself pretty much means, I didn't mean to inconvenience you. I didn't mean to be an inconvenience to you. I didn't mean for you to drop what you were doing... <laughs> and come to my house. I did not mean for you to stop helping others. I didn't mean for you, I, I, I really didn't mean to inconvenience you in any way whatsoever. Don't trouble yourself. 
And so I believe it was the centurion's full expectation that Christ would take care of his concern without missing a beat when it came to teaching others and ministering to those in need and doing healings and casting out demons and all those things that Christ is always found doing. That is pretty impressive. Because I will confess to you that oftentimes my prayer to God, I know there's a lot going on, but I have a need and I prefer if you to ignore all of that and focus on me. <laughs> right? I know there's a pandemic, there's floods, New York, <laughs> the whole thing right now, but hey, <laughs> here's something in my life and I need your undivided attention. That's not this centurion. It was never his expectation that Christ would ignore anything he was doing and focus solely on the need in his life. He says, I'm not worthy. I thought about who you are. I thought about who I am. And I'm not even worthy that you would come under my roof. And I do not think myself worthy to come to you. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then he does something that I love. He gives Christ an illustration. Now, usually in the Bible, Christ is the one giving the illustration. He's the one giving the parable. He's the one giving the analogy. But in this scene, he gives Christ the analogy. He says, for I am also a man placed under authority. <coughs> having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. <laughs> I say to another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and guess what? He does it. It's an object lesson he gives the Lord. Again, that's backwards. This is a man of tremendous authority. He says to Christ, listen, when I speak, there's immediate response. When I say move, people move. When I say go, people go. When I say stay, <laughs> they stay. This is a compassionate man. This is not a weak man. And when he speaks, his expectation is is immediate obedience. If you know anything about Rome, there were severe consequences if you didn't. You were not sometimes discharged from the military, you were sometimes discharged from life. <laughs> they took immediate obedience under authority really seriously. And that's the response he sends to our Lord from his life. He says, when I give a command to someone, there's no, let's talk about it. <laughs> there's no, sir, I'll do it later. There's no suggesting a better plan. When I give a command, it's obeyed immediately. That response and that illustration sent through his friends to our Lord literally stopped our Lord in his tracks. And there's really very few times that happened in his ministry. And it did here. Verse 9 says that when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. If I understand the word marveled, it's not like a firework, wow, it's kind of a slow moving Wow, that's really... It's like when you think about it. I'm from Bakersfield. We used to call it pondering. <laughs> it's, but the more you think about it, like, wow, that's really incredible. And so it's like as Christ just processes what just happened, he is amazed and he's impressed at what just took place. And he says to the crowd, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returned to the house and found the servant well who had been sick. 
Now, a couple of observations. One thing I realized in this passage and in the parallel passage in Matthew is that Christ never says the word. <laughs> Christ never says, your servant's healed. He never says the word. Which then to go back and look at the word, word. <laughs> Which really means it, it could be verbal. It's not necessarily. You can say things and not be verbal, right? Anybody married? <laughs> and that look, right? Or any father who gives their kid that look, right? There's just... It doesn't have to be verbal. This word could be translated to mean, to want, to desire, to simply will. He, in essence, says to Christ, I don't need you to drop what you're doing. I don't need you to... Li- if you will just want it. If you will just will it. It will be done. That is a great scene. And it certainly was an encounter that our Lord found refreshing. It's interesting, you look at commentaries and things like that, and they'll say what really impressed the Lord was His recognition of our Lord's power. Just like the Lord spoke creation, he understood the power of Jesus. If Jesus just wanted it, it was going to happen. And man, that's really cool. I don't think that's the case. I think what impressed the Lord is his understanding of the authority of Jesus Christ. Because the illustration he gives Christ is not about his power as a centurion. It's about his authority as a centurion. A lot of people admired the Lord for his power. Very few recognized his absolute authority. Now let's be real honest. It's a lot more fun to talk about the power of God in my life than the authority of God in my life. Amen? (laughs) The power of God is something I want. The authority of God in my life can sometimes be a point of tension. I'd rather have his power (laughs) than submit to his authority. His absolute power, I pray for. His absolute authority, sometimes I resist. Sometimes, that was a great word. Oftentimes, that's not in the air yet. Usually, always... (laughs) I find a lot less comfortable. Just say the word I love when it comes to me needing God's power in my life. I love just say the word when I'm wanting something from God. But when God's wanting something from me, (laughs) just say the word is not always as um, received. Oftentimes, I find myself saying, Lord, I know what you want. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Or, Lord, I know what you want. I'll get back to you. Uh, One of my favorites, Lord, I know what you want. I'll pray about it, which is just silly. Because like I, I'm going to pray about doing what you just told me what you want me to do. <laughs> right? It's a delay tactic. Or, Lord, I know what you want. Can we negotiate the terms? Or, I know what you want, but could you give me a little more information? How is this going to work out? What's this going to lead to? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of okay with this. If you could just give me a little more detail. I'm pretty sure I'll say yes. Just say the word is a lot more appealing when Jesus is doing something for me and not as appealing when Jesus wants something from me. But this passage is about the latter. 
This passage is about the latter. It's not simply the power of Jesus, which this man got. It was the authority of Jesus. You have so much authority, if you just say it, it's just like me as a Roman commander. And it seems to me that when Christ came across someone who understood his power and recognized his absolute authority, I think Christ was incredibly um, impressed. I'm going to speculate based on our Lord's response that was refreshing to him. Um, And that is the type of person that becomes incredible, um, an incredible tool in our Lord's hand. When a man of God, or when a man understands his need for the power of God, and then lives under the authority of God, that is a man that God is going to use (laughs) in some remarkable ways. So, here would be a couple of questions. Let's talk about the Lord's power. There's nothing wrong with desiring God's power in our life. Amen? But there's something wrong if we think we don't need it. Someone asked me the other day about public, about speaking God's word. I said, if I am not, if my stomach is not upset before I preach, it makes me nervous because that means I'm trusting my own power too much. That's why I don't eat before I preach. <laughs> if I'm not a nervous wreck, not a nervous wreck, if I'm not nervous, then that means I'm trusting too much in my ability and not my own, and that never goes well. And so there's nothing wrong with us recognizing our need for God's power, amen? And when we don't, it's bad news. But it's also, and so that's important to us. It's important to God <laughs> that we live under His authority. I want to read a verse for you that makes that a little more palatable. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at, and I love the word at a price, not with a price. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. That verse it's about the authority of God in my life. Because that verse says, you are not your own. Now, I tell you, as Americans and as men, that doesn't resonate. What do you mean I'm not my own? <laughs> I got rights. I, I get it. I got it. But that's what God says. He says, Daryl, you're not your own. I purchased you. I own you. But then the verse is quick to point out. But I didn't come cheap. (laughs) I was bought not with a price, because with a price can be bargained. At a price can't. I wasn't bought with a price, like any old price. I was bought at a price. And that at a price was a really high price. (laughs) We both know, or we all know, It was the blood of Jesus Christ. I like going to swap meets. Anybody? I like um, I like the negotiation of a swap meet. It's amazing to me at a swap meet because I'll go to the store and spend four and a half bucks for a cup of coffee. But a swap meet, if that two dollar cap isn't one seventy five, I'm walking away. It's a quarter. (laughs) It's just crazy. But I love the negotiating down because there's a certain sense of accomplishment. God says, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. 
I didn't negotiate down the price. I didn't send a few angels to see if they could do it. I didn't see how cheaply I could purchase your salvation. You were simply not bought out of, with a price. You were bought at a price. And it was a really expensive price. You and I are very expensive purchases of God. <laughs> we didn't come cheap. And when I think about that, and the price he paid for me, you're not your own doesn't seem so bad. Doesn't seem so unreasonable. I only chafe at it oftentimes because I forget the price he paid to have that authority in my life. God says, Daryl, I own you. I paid a <laughs> man, I paid a high price to purchase you. And you're not your own. So a couple things as I close. I don't know how long I'm supposed to speak here. (laughs) Um, One's encouraging. One's going to be incredibly challenging. Question one, in what areas, in what area today, do you need God's power? You say, God, you know, I've I've got this face in me today. And, um, man, if, if you don't come through, if you don't empower me, if you don't say the word, um, I'm pretty sure this won't go too well. And so it's not what area you need God's power in your life, it's what area you need God's power in your life today. And you might want to simply say to God, that's the one right there. Second question What is God saying to you that you simply say, Yes, I submit? Yes. Um, maybe something God wants us to do, or not do, or go, or not go, or stop going, whatever. And you would say to God, I, I don't have to think about it. Right now, your spirit is bringing this area to my mind that you have just been telling me, here's what I, and I have been negotiating and stalling and waiting for more information and praying about it and seeking counsel. I've been doing everything but obey. But obey. <laughs> And God, I'm just going to submit to your absolute authority in my life that you paid a really high price to get. And I'm just going to simply say yes. And trust you with the details and trust you with the timing and trust you with all the reasons I don't want to trust you and say yes. Bottom line is that when we when we truly understand the power of God and our need for it and when we truly live in the authority of God what we call the Lordship of Christ And we walk in those two. We become incredibly valuable as far as the Lord using us in kingdom work. Amen? And um, I believe the centurion, again, whose name we never know. (laughs) I'm pretty sure we'll meet him in heaven. (laughs) I'm very sure we'll meet him in heaven. Um, he models that for us and the Christ, um, our Christ um, reinforces that in his life. So before I pray, any questions? Any questions or comments? 
I guess I'm allowed to ask that. I did. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Just another uh, example of strong faith. Mm-hmm. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Anyone? Sounds like that's what it truly means to die to self, take up your cross daily, and follow. <coughs> yeah, and the key word there was daily. Right, die to self. In some of our lives, it's hourly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that might be a stretch. Amen. <laughs> well, this might be more of a comment, but um, I want to. It's allowed. It is okay. So, a couple of years ago, maybe ten years ago, I heard that one of our Marines, one of our young Marines was passing out Jesus coins to Afghanis when he would go through checkpoints. Mm -hmm. He was reprimanded by his command. And I understand that the, the, the official position of our government is let them do what they want. Don't try to tell them anything about truth. Mm -hmm. And my question is, do you think that had anything to do with Thank the you. shambles of this withdrawal? And our That's engagement? probably way above my pay grade. <laughs> um, yeah, I do not know. Um, I just certainly know anytime the gospel is suppressed, that's not good. Uh, whether it is Afghanistan or California or the United States or China. Uh, I also know the good news, though, is once the gospel gets in, you can't get it out. <laughs> I, I remember years ago, you know, I'm Southern Baptist. I also call Great Commission Baptist. I like our new name better. Uh, I remember when Russia opened. And I remember our, our IMB said, we need to get missions because this is a limited window. And so we need to redirect a lot of resources to Russia because this is not going to stay open forever. But what we knew is that once you get the gospel in, you can't get the gospel out. Amen? And so anytime a nation suppress the gospel, it's never good. But once we get the gospel in, they can get us out. You can't get the gospel out. Amen? Amen. <laughs> but those Afghani Christians, you need to pray for. So are there any Southern Baptists stuck in Afghanistan? No, we got them all out. Okay. Uh, our IMB got them out probably two months ago. Okay. Uh, but there's quite a few Afghani Christians that we reached. Um, who have chosen to stay there. Did you hear that? They've chosen to stay there uh, because that's where God's called them to be light. And so uh, there's, there's a lot more converts there than we publicize for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs>